Good day to you all. Thank you for joining the special online lesson for the finalists of the 9th Washoku World Challenge. The finalist we have with us today is from Taiwan, who is the kitchen manager at Tsukiyoiwa, a crab kaiseki restaurant, Mr. Yao Yo Peishi. Yo san, good afternoon. First of all, can you please give us a brief greeting and a self introduction? Hello, my name is Yo Peishi. I work at Tsukiyoiwa, a crab kaiseki restaurant. I'm a kitchen manager. And it's been 16 years since I became a chef. Nice to meet you all. Thank you very much. Let's enjoy the time. Thank you. And our instructor today is the third generation owner and chef of Nihon Bashi Yukari restaurant and Japanese cuisine goodwill ambassador. And he was also crowned grand champion of 2002 Iron Chef Japan Cup, Mr. Nonaga Kimio. Thank you very much, Nonaga-san. Thank you. Nanaga-san, have you been to Taiwan? No, not yet. This is one of the countries that I really want to visit. I hear it's, they have great food, it's close to Japan. We have similar culinary culture, and I think there are many inspirations. And so I really want to visit Taiwan the most. So Nanaga-san wants to visit Japan. Yo-san, have you visited Japan? Yes. Did you enjoy nice food? It's difficult to remember, but there are so many things that I enjoy. There are many delicious eateries. You like ramen too, don't you? Do you like ramen too? <laughs> Sorry, can you repeat? Yes, I go to eat ramen restaurants often, but when you get older, it gets tough on stomach. I was studying at technical college or culinary college in Japan for three years. That's wonderful. I hope you will learn a lot today. Thank you very much. And to the YouTube Live viewers, we will be answering your questions at the end of the session. So please feel free to submit them in the chat box. Let's get started. So first of all, Yao-san's work, which is Hamo no Kuzu Uchi, a soup with Hamo, sea eel coated in Kuzu. So let's get started. First of all, I would like to ask you, why did you decide on this piece, which is soup with sea eel coated in kuzu? The reason why I chose this dish is that I wanted to enclose the umami of hamo, sea eel, and also I wanted to emphasize the texture. And also, one of the characteristics of Japanese cuisine is knife work. And so I wanted to give clear emphasis on knife work. So do you do honegiri bone cutting often? Yes, when seals are in season, yes, I do the technique. So do you import from Japan? Are there hamo seals there? Yes, they are available, but they taste different. They smell fishy more than that. OK. So I think uh, your skill was thorough, and I can see that you are learning under the Japanese head chef. I could see that. And just one thing I noticed is the honegiri bone cutting technique. I thought you are not yet used to the honegiri technique. That's why I asked you the question. Hamo 
CEOs are good too, but I think uh, you have plenty of EOs as well. So I recommend that you experience, experience a lot more of the honegiri technique. I think uh, sometimes honegiri was not smooth enough. Well, yes, that's right. I, I bought the knife recently. Yes, that's what I felt. Because usually chefs use yanagi, the sashimi knife, but this special knife for honegiri, bone cut cutting, it has more weight. And so getting used to the weight is going to take some time. But once you get used to it, it becomes easier. So try to get used to that. So use the knife a lot. OK, now it's solved, because I thought it was not smooth. Nonaka-san, so we would love to see the honegiri technique. Yes, OK, why don't I demonstrate that? Thank you. Well, today I wanted to use Hamo, sea eel, or pike conger, but because of the sea condition, we couldn't get a hold of it. So we decided to use conger eel, pretty good one today. And our specialty is bone cut anago conger eel, and we parboil it. And this is one of our specialties. And so I learned the skill in Kyoto, but if I use hamo, sea eel, then people may think this is the Kyoto cuisine restaurant, and therefore I decided to use anago or conger eel. And that is why we serve conger eel. So first of all, you have the knife, but the way you hold the knife, you are holding it this way. But it's better to use your index finger like this. And then you are going rather straight. Many people do that, but I recommend that you tilt the knife slightly. And make incisions. Because Japanese knives are single-bladed, and so even if you went straight, it tends to go in inward. And therefore, in order to be conscious of that tendency, you tilt it to the other side. And by doing so, you can avoid the knife from going inside. And the knife is long from the tip to the bottom. You would like to use the entire length of the knife. So let's get started. So you start from the very end and make small incisions. And if you listen carefully, you can listen the sound. You, you can hear the sound of the bone being cut. So you can hear it. Just like this. And if you use the fish in the bowl, you normally need to add a tad bit of salt in order to extract the sweetness of the fish. And today, I am parboiling it. And so when you are parboiling it, you normally add salt, so it's OK. Just like this. And with the weight of the knife, 
you can slightly push it, then you can go through the fish. If you use yanagi knife, which is knife, the knife for sashimi, this will not happen. It's too light, and so that is why the knife is heavier. It is important to understand the meanings of each utensil. So you have deba knife, and then you have this yanagi knife, which is sashimi. And then for honegiri, you have honegiri knife. So although it seems that the bones have been cut sometimes, if it's not done precisely, then uh, the bones would uh, be filled in your mouth when you, uh, when you eat it. So I like to parboil the prepared conger eel. So there is a certain point when you parboil them. So you need to add uh, more salt than usual. The reason is just uh, parboiling it, it will be watery. So having a little more salt than usual and the amount you should decide by actually tasting it. So the concentration should be a uh, uh, little uh, less than sea water. So if you use uh, the appropriate amount of salt, then the sweetness of conger eel would come out. And please make sure to taste it. So uh, when you boil pasta, you add quite an amount of salt, but you need a little more salt than um, pasta boiling water. So the uh, necessary salt amount would be about half of that of the seawater. So same as the body, uh, this conga eel is protein. So you have to have the temperature high enough. And by, uh, by putting it into uh, boiling water, then the protein would sort of tighten at once. Uh, so for conga eels and sea eels as well, uh, the skin is gelatin. So if the <coughs> temperature is not high enough, the good taste will all come out into the water. Today, in the uh, former YouTube video, I have a sashimi already assorted, so not just wasting time by waiting for the water to boil. I would like to show you how to plate uh, the assorted sashimis. So I will put it on the counter. So this is how it goes. So it looks exactly like sea eel, doesn't it? So, so now the water is coming to a boil. It's about 85 degrees Celsius. So I'd like to taste it, whether I feel the saltiness enough. Yes, I think this is good. So you need to feel the saltiness. Unless 
the Congo EOC was just like, get into sort of a wishy washy taste. Have you ever tried parboiling these sea eel? What do you do afterwards after parboiling? After parboiling, what do you do? I put them into ice water. I think uh, this is a conventional idea to put them into ice water. Now we don't do that. The reason why not to do that is, I mentioned in the previous session as well, this conga eel, and as I have mentioned before, the conga eel and sea eel, when you parboil it, uh, the skin side will come, become soft. And when you put it into ice water, it becomes um, hard, it hardens again, like a rubber-like texture. And also, it will become a watery flavor. So I will tell you how to do it. So we put it into mm, boiling water, and then it opens up like flowers. And we'll wait a few moments until it comes to boil again. And because uh, the bones are nicely uh, cut, it will open up beautifully. And because uh, the ingredients are fresh and the bones are neatly cut, it will uh, open up like flowers. So you can take it uh, up on a strainer or a tightly um, squeezed towel like this. So you don't have to put them in ice water. So once you try to put the mm, chopstick inside, and if it if it doesn't go through smoothly, it shows that it's not cooked yet. If the chopstick goes through smoothly, then it's done. So take it up on a strainer or. Um, tightly squeezed towel and wait until it um, comes down, cools down to room temperature. If you put into ice water, the texture will harden. And also after uh, coming down to room temperature, you should not put it into refrigerator. So once the steam uh, <coughs> disappears, you just leave it here. So. So just put it in the cool place by covering it with a uh, um, wet towel. Then it will taste much better. And of course, it's up to your preference, but we, we uh, torch seared the surface of the Congo eel. Then it would have a good aroma. So I think you can play with it, whichever you like. So we have both one, both uh, parboiled one and torch seared one. So by torch seeding, can have a blood reaction and it will have a better aroma. Any questions so far? Are you fine? Yes, I'm fine, thank you. So now we would like Mr. Nonaga to give us a demonstration. Mr. Yo, should you have any question, please feel free to interrupt any time. So, Mr. Nonaga, please. So today uh, we are using this Congo eel to prepare a bowl dish later on. So your request was about how to uh, take good dashi, the broth. So you mentioned about ichiban dashi, the first batch of broth, how to take a good one. So first we have this kombu, kelp or bonita flake and bonita flakes. So these are the basic items for Japanese cuisine. We use makobu at our restaurant. And we have the shrinking one and the straight one. The difference is, so this will uh, open up when it is heated. So this is totally natural. And so when you buy this in uh, a grocery, you find it in this straight sheet style, but both taste the same. I use makobu, and people in Kansai area use the shiri kombu and debun kombu, but it's up to your preference. 
We have some points that already the kombu is inside the water. But to give you the recipe, 1,800 milliliters of water. And for that water, we use 25 grams of kombu or kelp. And we put them in the water. And very gradually, we uh, increase the temperature. I will show you the strength of the fire. So can you see it? It's really, the fire is really low. So very slowly, you bring up the temperature. We only have 1,800 milliliters water. So if the fire is too strong, so uh, the flavor of the kombu cannot be extracted enough. So if you want to draw out the full flavor of the kombu, you need to raise the temperature very slowly. The best temperature is from around 60 degrees to 70 degrees Celsius. That is the very best to extract the goodness of kombu. And so this is the same kelp kombu. Look at the difference in size and the thickness. Do you see the difference in thickness? And so we took time to bring the kelp to the size. So this is the same kelp kombu, but it enlarges to this size. And when you do cooking, recipe is important, but five senses are even more important. Look at the color and the smell. And then I have a flute glass, and always I'm using this so that you can see the color. So this is kombu dashi stock. So here you go. So you see the color, very light, and the smell. You smell. Help, but this is uh, the entire thing is glutamic acid, and glutamic acid has strong flavor, and it can multiply the flavor. So uh, after that, we are going to add bonito flakes, and it's going to even multiply the flavor. But the temperature, ideal temperature to extract the flavors are different. If you add if you add glutamic, uh, the kombu at glutamic uh, at this higher temperature, then this will be too fishy. And so therefore, at this temperature, you check the flavor. So it's really nice. So once you check that the kombu taste is extracted, and you have checked that, and then you remove the kelp from the pan. So you remove the kelp, but if you, we, there is another step that I want to do before I remove it. And I raise the temperature, and you see the bubbles. So now it's about 85 degrees Celsius. And once you have elevated the temperature to this temperature, then you extract another batch of flavor, and then you remove the kelp. Now you see the color of the kelp being extracted. And then you add 20 grams of bonito flakes, katsuobushi. So this katsuobushi, can you see the difference in color? Because I have removed the blood colored flesh. I don't know if you can get a hold of this kind of katsuobushi. Yes, we can. And so this is great for suimono, the clear soup. And right before boiling, you will add the katsuobushi flakes. And right after that, you turn off heat. And then you can see that this katsuobushi flakes coming down. So you don't stir. And then once everything precipitates, 
then we will strain the liquid. The paper towel is placed under the colander. And once you have strained it, you should not squeeze the bonito flakes. Some bitterness will come out. So let the liquid go down naturally. And I am going to check the color. So this is kombu dashi. And this is awase dashi. It is amber colored. You can see the difference. So this is the glutamic acid and inosenic acid, and it has even more aroma. And the difference first is the color, and the smells are different. Can you see the difference in color? There's a slight difference. It has a deeper color, so this is Ichiban dashi, so it's very clear and amber colored. And then the smell is beautiful. And here you adjust the sodium content. So with this, you add salt, sometimes light soy sauce, maybe a drop of soy sauce to adjust to the ideal taste. It's very different. And when I teach in my cooking class, I use flute glass to show the color. So you need five senses. You need to use five senses when you learn cooking. So I have just tasted the dashis. And if you wanted to make suimono, clear soup, then I want to add some saltiness to it, for example. Had a bit of salt, maybe a pinch of salt. And if you want some aroma of soy sauce, it's really tasty. Yes, I think I will add just a little bit of soy sauce for the aroma. By adding this aroma of soy sauce, it stimulates your appetite. So just a drop or two, just for the aroma. And then, So today we used anago conger eel. So this is parboiled conger eel. It can be sashimi though. Or you can enjoy as the center ingredient for the bowl or the soup bowl. So today I have all these garnishes. Yes, I'm sure you prepare like this. So to your taste, add Today I'm adding bamboo shoots because it's coming into season. And also this is mekabu. This is baby radish. So the basics for plating is to put the reds or greens in the center. And then the dashi is heated. Now I am going to ladle the suimono soup. So 
And the key here is that you're using the seasonal ingredient and also the color as well as the aroma. So aroma from now is no longer yuzu, but rather it is the seed, uh, the seed bud. Can you get a hold of kinome or the Japanese leaf buds or sometimes called pepper buds? Yes, uh, we can uh, get a hold of them imported. So in order to enhance the aroma, you pound it. And so for bowls or, of soup, always use the aroma. And when bamboo shoots come into season, it is the season for the kinome, which is Japanese leaf buds. And then now the bowl is ready. I'm going to open it. Now it is the perfect season, so you have cherry blossoms arranged at the back of the lid of the bowl. Just like this, and then you can taste a really uh, soft snow. It's Everything is breaking in your mouth and melting in your mouth, and you can also taste the aroma or the umami of it. So today, uh, your request was about how to make a fluffy shinjo, a dumpling of shrimp. Well, I think your restaurant specializes in crabs. So today, although I'm using shrimps or prawns, you can uh, apply it to crabs as well. So for this occasion, so it's easy to use a blender or a food processor, but today I wanted to use these uh, mortar. Have you tried it? Yes, I have. So today I want to use this. So today we're going to use prawns. So do you have the recipe already? Yes, I do. We're going to use 100 gram prawns. Uh, today we're using frozen black tigers. So if you use tiger prawns, it will be five times much expensive, but it tastes five times much better, actually. So black tiger has a um, unique smell, so I sort of rinsed it with Japanese sake. After removing the shell and rinsing it in water, then add sprinkle a little sake and then sort of um, knead it a little. So using half of the total amount, that means 50 grams. So put them into the mortar and so make sure to wet this before using. When using these wooden utensils, you have to rinse it once, unless it will absorb all the smells of the ingredients. Of course, you can use for the food processors but I'm going to do it all by hand today. So people in all times, we're doing this. I think food processor takes less than one minute to do all the things. But actually, the texture would be better prepared in this manner. I recommend this way to do it. So it is coarsely ground, and by mixing it with fish paste, it really tastes and good. It has a nice texture. I think young people are not used to using this mortar now. 
you press uh, the top with your one hand and then circulate on both ways. So now it is in a paste like style. We have yam or Chinese yam, nagaimo. We have this minced white fish meat and egg white. So we're going to use 100 gram of minced white fish meat and egg white, a uh, one egg white. We don't use the yolk. So we want to make the shinjo, the dumpling, white. Do you have Chinese yam in your country? Yes, we do. So this is already grated. We're going to use 30 grams of them. And add it here. Adding this nagaimo, the texture will be very different. Next, add the minced white fish meat. Then add the egg white as well. Sometimes you whisk the egg white and then add, but today you are not going to whisk it, but add it just as it is. Still, it will be fluffy enough. And for seasoning, I do nothing today. The reason is the minced fish meat is already salty enough. So just by the saltiness of the fish meat and by having these prawns together, I think the saltiness will be just nice. So today uh, we would like to do it simple without adding any season seasoning. So while mixing, it's starting to get all fluffy. And also let's use this kind of spatula. And then mix again. So if you use food processor, or the texture would be too smooth. And after this, we'll be adding um, roughly cut prawns. So having a lot of texture mixed inside one thing would be nice. So you can feel that you are actually eating uh, dumpling with prawns. And we're going to um, add some seasoning to the broth. So not having too much strong taste to this dumpling would be better to go with the broth. So you can use uh, many things such as oysters or scallops. Now we're going to add the remaining prawns. We're going to cut them. So we want to have the texture. So we'll cut one piece into about four. So having this, uh, we'll, have, um, <coughs> we'll make the dumpling have a nice texture. So it will be about one centimeter long for each piece.
So your movement is very rhythmical. So it's quite tiring <laughs> because it's been a long time since I did this the last time. So actually, you don't need to um, use much strength. You, you just press it with one hand and then go round. So make sure to have a towel beneath so that it won't slip. So go either way, clockwise, anti-clockwise. So if you want to shorten the time, you can always use the food processor or the blender. So we'll now add the prawns. Oh, it's really fluffy. Now the rest of the prawns have to go in. Then lightly mix them. So you can use scallop, or crab, anything. So clams would be nice in this season. Then we're going to roll them up into balls. I have sent you the recipe about 60 grams per dumpling is going to be perfect. Perhaps 63 grams. And today, I'm using this little bowl, like this one, it's kobachi, and then I layered it with a plastic wrap. And I am pouring this surimi, so I'm going to divide the entire surimi into five. And then I wanted to make it a sphere shape today, but in some restaurants, they put it, they pour it in a pan and then steam it and then will be cut into shapes such as square. So it can be either way. And I have divided into five portions. If you weigh them, I would say it would be about 65 or 63 to 65 grams. Today I used nagaimo, which is Chinese yam, but you can also use yamatoimo, Japanese yam, or any kind of sticky yam would be perfect. So, there are frozen grated yam available. So you can use it in the same way. And the objective is to obtain juicy and soft texture. And so this kind of yams, either Chinese or Japanese yam, please make sure to add them. And now, next tip. And then make sure that you take uh, remove the air bubbles by tapping, and then diagonally line the plastic wrap and tighten the top. And so you don't need rubber bands. You can just keep the shape just like this. 
and you're using this small ball. And when you do this, you always want to remove the air. And you want to have a smooth surface and make sure that you have a towel underneath. You can hear the air coming out. And just in the same way, twist the top, just like this, and repeat. So for the interest of time, I'm, I'm going to change this. Yansan, do you have steam convection at your restaurant? Yes. Yes, we do. That's great. Intentionally today, I am using the steamer. I want to make it handmade, everything. So if you cannot get a hold of food processors or steam convection ovens, I just wanted to say that you can make them even without. And the key is the temperature. Everything is rich in protein. Actually, they're all protein. And at high temperature, they tend to coagulate. So the temperature for coagulation of protein is 62 to 63 degrees Celsius. So if you heat them slowly, the food will have a soft texture. And so for the steamer, you first heat at high heat, and for the convection oven, you want to set at 85 degrees Celsius. And with that, either chawamushi, the steamed custard, or this kind of steamed dish, you can heat at, at to yield the perfect texture. And you put into the steamer or eat a, a steam convection with the bowl. And the duration of steaming would be about 15 minutes. And now I'm heating at high, but you will lower the heat once you have put in the bowl. And when you open the lid, uh, in order for you to not to get burned, you turn off the heat. You can hear it. And then remove the lid once. And I open. OK, so this is actually, this has been steamed. And so now I can show you the finished piece. You can see the difference in color, and it's beautifully red and white. After 15 minutes of steaming, you will yield this kind of color. OK, I will start plating. I will use these two, maybe one. It is delicious, freshly made, but now you can make five. And so you can cook or make them in advance. And when the guest arrives, you can immediately serve in a bowl of soup or something like that. Now I will unwrap it. The color combination is perfect. It's great for celebration. And then I'm adding bamboo shoot. And add all the other vegetables in the same way. Okay. 
then I'm going to ladle the dashi. This is an important step too. The steamer is heavy. And I want to heat the dashi. And I don't want the dumpling to go cool, so I'm going to put, place the lid on the bowl. And you want to make sure that the dashi is heated well, because you want to, the guests to enjoy the aroma when the guest opens the bowl. And this aroma that I have mentioned, you can enjoy the aroma of the prawns, but also this Japanese leaf buds, and that will react to the heat and it will give out even nicer aroma. And the steam will enhance the aroma of the ingredients, so please do make sure that you heat the dashi, but do not boil it. Ideally, you can see the bubbles from the bottom of the pan, and so ingredients and utensils give you signs when you're cooking, so make sure to notice those signs. So you can see the steam coming out. So just, just by seeing the steam coming out, it's not all right. We have to see the bubbles coming out from the bottom. Maybe a little bit more. So you can see the bubbles now. Yosan, any question? So the steaming time, you said about 15 minutes with 85 degrees Celsius. 85 degrees Celsius, 15 minutes, yes. Then, so what is the heating temperature when, uh, when we're heating? 85. So at what temperature do you use your steam convection when heating? around 100 degrees Celsius. Our steam convection is always 90 degrees Celsius. At 90 degrees, uh, things could be heated. And for eggs um, pudding, it will not get too bubbly. It will done nicely smoothly with the 90 degrees Celsius. So from 85 degrees to 90 degrees Celsius, to disinfect the ingredients, 90 degrees will be enough. And when heating the dishes, I think around 90 is good. So at our restaurant, steam convection is always set at 90 degrees Celsius. Now it's done. So here you are. So this is the uh, shrimp shinjo, the dumpling soup. So another bowl with a different cherry blossom patterns. It smells very good. So you feel this that the shinjo dumpling could be quite large, but just by inserting your chopsticks, it will cut very smoothly, lightly. Have you tried? A hanpen, uh, another dumpling of white fish. So the image is similar to that hanpen. It's really soft and fluffy. So uh, it's really soft, I understand. And we added prawns today. So the prawns are now mixed with the um, minced fish. So the outside is really fluffy and soft, but also you can enjoy the um, chewiness of the prawn. So then the uh, prawn taste would come out. If, if we can make a lot of shinjo, could it be frozen? Yes, that's okay. 
Yes, these um, <clears throat> dumplings could be frozen. And also you can use um, Spanish mackerel or sea bream. White fish could be used. Any white fish is possible. So today we used cod for that, but white meat fish could be used. Any white fish. And if you don't have these kind of dumplings, you can use this kamaboko or hanpen, and you can mix that, uh, make them into paste by adding some water. It could be a substitute for this uh, dumpling base. This kamaboko is another sort of um, minced white fish meat. Any questions so far? <laughs> Just a moment, please. So today we use 100 grams of black tiger prawns, but please try to use uh, crabs instead so that you can make it a specialty of your restaurant. Once it is frozen, how can we thaw it? The shinjo itself. The, the prepared shinjo, you mean, yes. So put it into the refrigerator and then thaw it and then and put it into the steamer, then it will be fine. If you have steam convection, you can put it into uh, uh, as it, uh, in a frozen state and it will come out nicely. So it could be um, used in various ways. Today, we steamed it, um, made it into a broth, but I recommend it to be fried with oil as well. It would be nice as well. I think a, your son's uh, chef at your restaurant would master this recipe. And I think this would be another specialty of your restaurant. So please tell all the guests that uh, you've learned this recipe from Nihonbashi Yukari. So is it possible to add some gingers or anything else? Today we did not add any aromatic ingredients, but if adding something, I would recommend ginger. Grated ginger juice would be fine, but also having um, finely um, chopped ginger. It will be very nice as a texture. About 10 grams, I think it will be ideal. So fine chopped gingers would be nice. For crabs and uh, prawns, it would cool down your body. So this is a Japanese conventional uh, knowledge. So you usually add a ginger into your uh, vinegar, vinegar for the crab. I think you add ginger, don't you? Yes. It is a sensible thing because crab cools your body. So to prevent your body from cooling, you always add ginger to the vinegar for the crab. So in the same manner, about 10 grams of ginger, chopped gingers, it will be a good for either crab or prawns. It will be a nice accent to go with. Thank you very much. Uh, we have received uh, several questions beforehand from Yosan, so I would uh, ask on your behalf. So if you want to add something, please uh, don't hesitate. So unlike Japan, Taiwan does not have much uh, difference in season. So we want to add some seasonal aspect. What kind of things we can do to add some seasonal touch? Maybe you can um, think about the table where you choose. So I told at the previous session, in Japan we have four seasons. I think Taiwan is hot all through the year. To, uh, present some coolness, you can use glasswares. So I think the outside is quite hot. So, so tomato or eggplants or cucumbers, these things that comes from the branch uh, have the um, effect to cool your body. So we are aware of that effect, effect of these um, <coughs> vegetables. So these are the summer menu. On the very left is our starter. So we are serving a cold um, egg, uh, egg pudding. So this is a green piece paste added on top. And we have some uh, cracked rice crackers and paprika powder. So it looks nice in terms of color. So it is a very cold 
egg pudding. So this is a green piece paste, a seasonal thing. Also, you can also use soybeans as well, or broad beans. Or you can also blend uh, fried eggplants as well. Thank you very much. On the right bottom, this is eel. This is eel to get coming together with eggplants. In summer, Japanese people um, do not have much appetite, so to uh, <coughs> make them have more appetite, we have uh, made a sandwich of eggplants and fried eggplants and an eel, and we have a very thick sauce on it. So by doing so, we can entertain uh, the seasonal uh, things. So Japanese cuisine is made uh, very logically. So I'm trying to explain what I'm doing. So uh, actually, I myself is not explaining to the guests, but uh, the, <coughs> the service personnel can provide this explanation to the guests. So what is the idea behind a special menu? So in that way, the guests will be able to feel that they are being entertained in that way. So I think it would be nice if you can give an explanation to the guests. So because you specialize in crab, so then you can tell them that uh, crabs can cool your body. So that is why we add a little bit of ginger. So these little clues or hints uh, would entertain your guests. So I think that is a nice thing to do. Thank you very much. Another question from Yo-san. Yo-san, as you compose the menu, you wanted to get some hints, right? Yes, that's right. Are you doing the kaiseki cuisine? This is crab kaiseki cuisine, correct? So you are crab specialist restaurant, and therefore you can feature crab. But our specialty also is chawamushi, which is egg custard. But in Japan, everybody likes it. But you can sometimes use uh, cod milk or blowfish milk. And nowadays, it is difficult to get people from overseas to visit Japan. And people tend to be a bit uh, taken aback uh, when they look at uh, this kind of a uh, fish gut being used, but then I add mozzarella cheese to the egg custard, and uh, they get, are surprised to know that there are eggs. Uh, so this is a uh, Tokyo produce uh, egg custard using Tokyo produce, and then also I use uh, mozzarella cheese from Hokkaido, uh, so really a white sauce is poured on top. And so this is Japanese cuisine, but this is new Japanese, so I call new washako because new is also for dairy, so I'm um, making this uh, pun uh, with, so this is the new washaku, new dairy washaku, so please do laugh here. And uh, yes, I can make my guests laugh. So if the guests eat it, they can enjoy it. So sometimes they are surprised that uh, dairy products are used in washoku or Japanese cuisine. But nowadays, I'm, I'm 50 years old, but I think uh, we can see that uh, dairy go very well with dashi. So try, try dashi with mozzarella cheese and uh, try to top mozzarella cheese on top of the chawamushi egg custard. So it can be green pea sauce or it can be mozzarella cheese sauce or any other vegetable sauce. And so you can play with the topping or sauce and extract the seasonality. And so you can start the meal with chawamushi, and then you can also serve appetizer, a seasonal appetizer. And then I don't know what kind of crab dish you serve. It can be grilled. And if you are serving pot, then you don't need a soup or bowl. Uh, for the course, so I, this is how I compose the course. So if you are giving the full crab dish, then you are giving uh, crab shabu-shabu or grilled or fried crabs, then 
I would add a specialty as a starter with a varied sauce for the season, so you can make it your specialty. Thank you very much. And there is another question. When Japanese cuisines are prepared overseas, what is the tip? Great comment. Thank you very much. I have traveled overseas because I'm a Japanese cuisine friendship ambassador. And just like today, when I conduct the demonstration of kombu and katsu, people don't like it or people don't get it. Do you know why? because they don't know where to get a hold of the ingredients or sometimes they're too expensive. So when I do the demo overseas, I go to eat their local food. There are many restaurants in Japan as well, Vietnamese cuisine or Indonesian cuisine, and I eat their specialty. And I try to do the Japanese arrangement of their specialty dish. For example, in Vietnam, there's buy me this kind of a baguette sandwich. Do you know? And then people eat it on a daily basis. This is like onigiri rice ball for us. So for example, so when I do the demonstration and I made a bowl of soup and then they don't get it. And then from here, I say, this is my original dish. So for example, wagyu or yellowtail booty, and then I will present the buy me using those ingredients, the most expensive buy me in the world with Wagyu, and people get surprised. And as you can see, this Kobe beef, Matsudaka beef, and you can do shabu shabu, and then you add sesame ponzu, citrus soy sauce, and then you put that into the bread, the baguette, and then you add takuan pickled radish, and then you add coriander. It tastes great, and that way you are received more quickly. And so maybe I don't know what the specialty of Taiwanese cuisine is. So if I get to visit your country, then I would study the Taiwanese cuisine. And then I try to adapt the popular food in your country. This is how I approach. Thank you. Is Japanese cuisine popular in Taiwan? Yes. Are these ramen restaurants? Not necessarily the, the, the pure washoku. Nowadays, unlike the old days, about, well, for example, 30 years ago, Taiwanese people thought washoku would be sushi, sashimi, and tempura. So that it would be accepted as a very expensive Japanese restaurant. But that is 30 years ago. But nowadays, people know better. And so we need to be able to serve specialty Japanese foods. For example, they go to specialty sushi restaurant if they wanted to have sushi. And so people are educated. And I have watched a program on TV and one plate, this Japanese style Western food is also popular, isn't it? Like a Japanese yoshoku, which is Japanese style Western food, it's getting popular. Is that true? I do not think so. This one, one plate or one dish meal. Because in Taiwan, our culture is very eclectic. But these days, unlike the old days, people are more health conscious. Therefore, they prefer lighter washoku. Yes, that's right. And just a while ago, so some people said washoku served in the in the U.S. is not true washoku, but I don't think so because. I don't want to criticize that. There are many ways that local people developed in each places. And so, for example, carpaccio, the Japanese people can come up with a fish carpaccio, but in Italy, meat is served in carpaccio. It can be horse meat and it can be beef and thin sliced meat with olive oil with seasoning. 
So that is carpaccio. So Japanese people traveled and learned carpaccio and came back to Japan, and then they served cold fish carpaccio, or sometimes cold spaghetti pasta is served in Japan as well. So I think uh, there is local proper food culture, so I don't want to deny that. So I think if th there can be the reverse importing of a uh, Taiwanese version of Japanese cuisine, and if we have, like, I, I don't understand that there are many upscale sushi restaurants, and people want to enjoy the authentic sushi. I think once the COVID crisis is over, people will be coming from all over the world to enjoy the genuine sushi, kaiseki, or ramen. And I think uh, those restaurants will be filled with people from all over the world. So I think in any, any of those uh, places in the world, I don't criticize the Japanese cuisine arranged in the local version, because as they understand Japanese cuisine, people would like to come to Japan to taste the authenticity of it. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I, we have received some questions from the YouTube live viewers. And this is about dashi. When kelp kombu is removed, do you, you not need to remove the bubbles or scum? No, no need, because eventually you will strain the broth. And sometimes people remove the scum very thoroughly, but you eventually strain it. Today I use the strainer and the, the paper towel, but you don't need to be that thorough because you will remove the dashis as well. And so if, rather than that, you need to wash the kombu kelp thoroughly and wipe the kelp. And then if you did that, then you don't need to worry too much about it. So how about the kombu after taking the dashi? What would you do with them? Oh, this is only used for ichiban dashi, so it still has a lot of taste. So you can also use it for niban dashi, the second batch of dashi. And my recommendation is to cut up this used kombu into little pieces like this. And, and you stuck it into the freezer. And if you have about one kilogram of them, you can cook them softly in the pot. Then you can have a sort of a pickled kombu. So I'm wearing a SDGs badge here. Japanese cuisine is, is originally we say um, itadakimasu. That means we are eating the life of the vegetables of life of other uh, creatures. And we have a spirit of using everything that we can. So if we uh, waste them, if we put them into the garbage, it will be a waste, but we can use it. So if you have a one week amount of kombu, and if you uh, accumulate this amount for about one month, you can cook it with a with a sweet uh, taste. And if you add some uh, bonito flakes on top of it, you can have a very nice uh, pickled kombu. So we cannot have bonito flakes. So I am shaving bonito flakes myself. Uh, this uh, really hardened bonito is very difficult to uh, shave smoothly. So is there any good way how about uh, wiping the uh, bonito with a white wet towel or but the bonito uh, dried bonito is really hard I think there is a certain direction to shave it I don't have the uh, bonito right now but there is a certain direction for you to shave it properly so looking closely so I'm sorry, this is not the bonito, but dried bonito, but you can see the skin remaining. So placing the skin on top and get taking hold of the skin, then the head part will become 
in the bottom. So the remaining skin is the tail part. So you can see the sort of uh, the fiber in the dried bonito. So, so if you do it in the other direction, the flake will not come out smoothly. So be careful to identify where the remaining skin is and get hold of the skin part. So you never should uh, wet the dried bonito or never steam. It's a dried good. So unless it is totally hardened, it cannot be carved. So if you go to a Japanese supermarket, you can have a sort of um, a ready-made soup stock in a granulated style. So, and so you don't have these flake style yet, I understand. So it may be difficult to identify the direction, but uh, there is a YouTube. Uh, there is a corporation called Nimben uh, that specializes in dashi or bonito flakes. So I think you can learn from these YouTubes to identify the direction, how to shave the hardened bonitos. And also, uh, the, and you also, also wanted to learn how to sharpen the kitchen knives. So can you demonstrate? how to sharpen them properly. The Japanese knives are one side bladed, only one bladed. So uh, one part is um, vertical, the other side, only one side has blade. How many whetstones do you have? Do you have a lot of them? So man-made diamond, a natural thing, I have a lot of them. Wow, that's great. So um, you have to adjust the angle properly. And I think uh, you need to accumulate your experience. So doing it repeatedly, I think you can learn. So just less the bone cutting of the CEO, I think you are able to sort of improve yourself. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Nonaka-san, for telling us such a lot. So Yo-san, can you tell us how you felt? Can you uh, tell us your impression about the session? I'm really grateful for everything you have told me. I learned a lot today. So many things uh, that I didn't know uh, was included in today's session, so it really was useful. I'm glad to hear that. I hope that one day I can visit your country. So I'm going to talk uh, the matter to the Ministry of Agriculture. Uh, I hope I can have a collaboration with you in the future. So I am actually an Iron Chef champion, so. So Yo-san, I think uh, you're long to become an Iron Chef one day. So thank you very much, Mr. Yonaga, and also thank you very much, uh, Yo-san, for joining us. And I would like to thank all of the participants at the YouTube. I hope you had a good time. So now the uh, special online lesson for the finalists of this ninth uh, competition of Washok Pro Challenge is going to be uh, completed. So Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, we're going to post uh, many informations onwards. So. So please uh, remember to follow us. So, Nonaka-san and uh, Yo-san, can you wave your hands to all the viewers? So thank you very much for stay, staying, staying with us till the end. Thank you very much. So see you in Taiwan, hopefully. Thank you very much.